God to pray. pray. That, was, that was a pretty good sound check. That's good. <laughs> it's good to be here tonight. We thank y'all again for having us. But most of all, I thank my Heavenly Father for all of his blessings. And um, so many of the people in the world today say they ain't no God, but there is a God. He's alive to 
blessed us. You know, these last few years have been rough. You know, what we've done a few years ago was what was right then is wrong now. What we've done wrong back then is right now. You know, that's, that's the way this world is getting to be. You know? Evolution is taught by man. They took prayer out of the schools and violence filled our land. They've ordered the Ten Commandments to be removed from our sight. But there's one question I'd like to ask them. What's wrong with living right? What's wrong with living right? Can anybody tell me? I'm doing what I know to do. I'm living for Jesus. He's away. say that I'm a little strange for living the way I do. Different from this old world. Out of step. Oh, how true. Call me crazy or insane and tell me that I'm not right. I like to ask you What's wrong with living right? What's wrong with living right? Can anybody tell me? I'm doing what I know to do I'm living for Jesus He's the way
us. Yep, we can. Anyway, um, every year I come, I always have to brag on my Heavenly Father. I, I hadn't seen my heart doctor this year, but I seen him last year, and they keep telling me the same thing, and I keep telling them God's healed me. But I give him all the praise and all the glory because I know we couldn't do nothing without him. And you heard me say it ain't about us, but it's about him and seeing souls saved. And sometimes all we have to do is just speak his name. He's right there for us. Her primary doctor says, you know, singing is the best exercise for her heart. You know, I had her out weed whacking weeds the other day. <laughs> sound of angel wings it makes me feel so close to home I like to see a smiling face on a sinner saved by grace it makes me feel so close to home
someday well I keep a holding on to that nail scarred hand I'm not giving up no I'll keep it going on been a walking through this valley through this veil of tears at times I've even questioned even if my Lord was near many times that old tempter says why not turn around you can't get any further because you're just a losing ground well I'm not giving up no I'm not turning around by the grace of God I'll win a shining ground someday well I keep holding on to that nail scarred hand I'm not Keep it going on Would you mind to tell me There's been something bothering me Why is it that old devil He won't let God's children be You see he has a purpose And determined to get in the way and lead us from the way of life and lead our souls astray well i'm not giving up no i'm not turning around by the grace of god i'll win a shining crown someday well i keep holding on to that nail scarred hand I'm not giving up no I'll keep it going on I'm not giving up giving up no I'm not turning around turning around by the grace of God I'll win a shining crown someday well I keep a hold
we have his blessings, yet we're still to praise his name. Said if we're ashamed of him, to us so he'd be the same. When he gave his life at Calvary, he did it for all men. So that I could stand and proudly say, I've been born again, I'm not ashamed. Mine will be easily deterred. Amen. Amen. Because there's a lot of things in the way that can try to deter us. But we're going to be in Proverbs chapter six tonight. Proverbs chapter six. This will be more of a study on on, on a particular set of verses here in Proverbs chapter 6, but we'll start at verse 16. Proverbs chapter 6, verse 16, it says, These six things doth the Lord hate, yea, seven are an abomination unto him, a proud look, a lying tongue, and hands that shed innocent blood, a heart that deviseth wicked imaginations, Feet that be swift in running to mischief, a false witness that speaketh lies, and he that soweth discord among brethren. Let us pray. Lord, Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word, and we thank you for the instruction of your word, and the guiding of your word in this life. I pray that you'd help us to understand what your word means for us today, and how to apply it to our life, and how to share it with others. And I pray that you would keep us by your word. And it's all in Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. These six things does the Lord hate, yea, seven are an abomination unto him. Now I know the God that we serve, he's a God of love. Amen. says God is love. Amen. But this here tells me there's some things that God hates. And I think naturally, if you love certain things, you'll naturally hate other things. Amen. If you love life, then you're going to hate that th those things which take life. Amen. Uh, there, there's a contrast. There's a, uh, it naturally comes. But God says these things, does he hate? Yea, seven are an abomination unto him. And we hear that word kind of often sometimes. But that word abomination here means something disgusting morally or an abhorrence, or aberrance, excuse me, uh, something that is, is just disgusting in the sight of the Lord that, that really turns up his nostrils, so to speak. Yeah. Something he hates. It's disgusting unto him. And you know, all, out of all the sins we could come up with, we can come up with a whole list of sins a mile long, amen, but the writer here chose to put seven right here that he says that the Lord hates and they are an abomination unto him. And you know, when he says an abomination, the things that are disgusting to him, you know, why? I've I, I got to ask the question, why are they disgusting to God? Why are these things disgusting to God? And, and when it comes to any sin, things that are disgusting to him, I guess you would say, are an abomination unto him, it's those things that are in direct opposition to the very nature and character of God. They're in opposition to who He is. I mean, they naturally come to attack His character and who He is. So naturally, they would be disgusting in His sight because they oppose God Himself. Amen? Also, they are thing, they're things that are against his design and his purpose for this life, for this creation. Almost as to say in a defying way, to, to 
to defy his authority, amen? And that kind of leads into the very first one. When he says, these six things does the Lord hate, yea, seven are an abomination unto him. The first one, a proud look. It's in defiance against God. A proud look and a lying tongue, and we're going to take these two together. Truth is the character of God. It's in his character. He is truth. Jesus Christ said, he, I am the way, the truth, and the life. He is truth. So the lying tongue, I mean, that's, that's kind of obvious that that's in opposition to God. But the other one might not be in, in, in so obvious, but both are in opposition to the truth of God. The second for obvious reasons, but the first because if we believe ourselves to have anything of ourselves to boast of, amen, or in, we are deceiving ourselves and we believe a lie. If we think we can boast of anything Amen. to say, uh, I have done this, or I have done that, or there's any good in me, yeah, I'm deceiving myself. I, I am proudful to think that I am something, and I deceive myself. In James chapter 21, I'm going to read there for a second. Not tw chapter 21, chapter 1, verse 21. says, Wherefore, lay apart all filthiness and superfluity and naughtiness, and receive with meekness the engrafted word, which is able to save your souls. But be ye doers of the word, and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. For if any be a hearer of the word, and not a doer, he is likened unto a man, beholding his natural face in a glass." For he beholdeth himself, and goeth his way, and straightway forgetteth what manner of man he was. Amen? It's a man that, that will hear the word of God, and, and in a sense thinks, well, I'm just fine without it. And he doesn't take it and apply it to his life. In 1 John chapter 1, we read something similar. 1 John chapter 1, verses 8 and 9 said, if we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. Pride would lead you to say, I'm not full of sin. No, not me. I'm just fine. A proud, proud look. Amen? The truth is not in that person. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Amen? A proud look and a lying tongue, they both go against the truth of God. The truth of God is we're in need of a Savior, amen. The truth of God is we're plagued with sin. The Bible tells us that, that every man sins and comes short of the glory of God. See, they both set themselves in opposition against the truth of God. By not applying these scriptures... By not applying these scriptures, we deceive ourselves, amen? We deceive ourselves to think that we are something that we are not. And you see, a proud look will naturally cause you to reject the truth. It will naturally cause you to, to reject the truth. And many of the sins that follow in our life is a direct result of pride in our life, amen? It is a direct result of pride in our life. But if we were to open up, bring down that wall, that barrier, amen? 1 Peter 5, verses 5 and 6 says, Likewise, younger, submit yourselves unto the elder. Yea, all of you be subject one to another. Be clothed with humility. For God resisteth the proud and giveth grace to the humble. Amen? Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time. Amen? You stand up against the Lord when you stand up in pride, amen? amen? And you come against Him rather than come with Him. Amen. The next one says, Hands that shed innocent blood. You see, life is in the very nature of who God is. God created life. He is the life and the life giver. Christ Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. And He also said, again, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. So to kill life or to take away innocent life 
is again to go against the very nature of who God is. Amen. Cain was cursed by God for this very act. When he killed his brother Abel, he was cursed and, and made to wander in the, as a vagabond. Amen? God instituted capital punishment for this. There in Genesis chapter 9, after the flood, he says, if any man kills or, or takes the, the life of an innocent man, that man's life shall be taken as well. He instituted capital punishment because of this sin, of the murder and taking of innocent life. Amen? It's a disgust to him. It's an abomination unto him. As God sent the children of Israel, He wiped out entire nations through Israel as they went in to Canaan for this very thing. The people of that land, they were worshiping their false gods and their false idols, and they were sending their children to be sacrificed, amen, sending them through the fire of Molech, it was, it was said. Killing innocent babies, amen. And He wiped out this whole nation. Maybe not for that one sin, but among other things. It was a disgust in his sight. The shedding of blood. Since God is the life giver, it's not for us to be the life taker. Amen? And we put ourselves in opposition. But you know what? I got to thinking about that. Most anybody would not argue, hey, it's wrong to kill. It's wrong to kill. I think we could all pretty well understand that. But... Do we think about it with our words? Because I know it says hands that shed innocent blood, but we can shed innocent blood through our words as well. In Proverbs 18 and 21, it says, Death and life are in the power of the tongue. In the tongue. And again, it says, The words of the wicked are to lie and wait for blood. You know, we can do a lot of damage, and we can absolutely drain the life out of people through our words. I wasn't here for the message, but I hear Jimmy talk about it every now and then, how he preached on uh, how Satan is like Dracula. And he'll suck the life right out of you. Our words can do the same thing. It can draw the life out of people through what we say with our words. And it's not just what we say to people, but what we say about them. Amen? Amen. It can absolutely destroy somebody. And we'll be careful with knives, we'll be careful with guns not to take the life of the innocent person, but how quick we are to use our tongue and not care a bit how we're handling it. Just wave it all around. Go around shooting it like my son with their toy guns. Those are just toy guns, but, but we use our words in such a way. It's an abomination. It's an abomination to take the life when we ought to be using our tongue to lift up life. Amen. Because he said death and life are in the power of the tongue. Don't you realize, church, don't we realize what power we have with our tongue? Amen. And naturally so, God created everything that we see through his word. Amen. What power we have also, for we are created in the image of God to give life. Let's choose to give life through our tongue. This is why Titus, in Titus, we, we read that he tells Titus here, Paul tells Titus, he says, speak evil of no man. And when I read that, I looked up that word evil, and, and it, to speak evil means, it, it's the same word that was used, or translated to blasphemy when talking about the Holy Ghost. Blasphemy no man. That word blasphemy meant to vilify, to speak impiously, to defame, or to rail on. I mean, do we do that with our words sometimes? And we don't think nothing of it. But we'll blasphemy somebody so quickly and so easily. Speak evil of no man. Because you might be shedding innocent blood. He might be shedding innocent blood. Moving on to the next one, he says, In a heart that deviseth wicked imaginations, and feet that be swift in running to mischief. And these kind of go together, and, and they go against the fact that God is righteous and holy, and there is no evil in Him. There is no evil in Him. 
And it is the wicked and evil thoughts and deeds of man that put us in opposition against God. Our thoughts and our deeds, these evil things that pursue out of us, amen, they put us in opposition to God once again. These two are connected and they speak to the things of a, to the cravings of a wicked heart. See, it's, it's in the heart of man to crave wickedness, to, to love that which is evil. Apart from God, that's true. It is. And I know no man wants to admit that, but that's the truth. There's a craving within us that loves evil, that loves wickedness. And it's a disgust in the sight of God because in Him is no thing impure or unholy. He is perfect and righteous and holy in all things. So when we have our cravings of wickedness, we're putting ourselves in opposition to God. If our thoughts are evil, our deeds will be also. See how they go from one to the other. He says, the heart that deviseth wicked imaginations. What you put your mind to, that's ultimately what you're going to put your body to doing. Amen. Amen. Amen? The more you meditate on one thing, the more you're going to act it out in this bodily form. Amen? God's judgment, God's judgment fell upon man through the flood because of this very thing. If we go back to Genesis, it talks us about their evil imaginations. And it says that their thoughts were evil continually. And that thought, those thoughts of evil, it was unrestrained, un, undialed back. It's like there was no trying to stop it out, it seemed like. Man was just running rampant. There was no restraint on this evil imagination. What did it lead to? It led to violence. So their imagination led to mischief. Church, if we don't get a hold of our imagination, what we set our minds to, it's going to lead to mischief. The wickedness. And I know this is kind of broad in a sense. I mean, there's so much that you could put under the umbrella of evil imaginations and wickedness. Amen. But again, it comes down to the, the cravings of this heart that desire the things that aren't holy. Again, apart from God. But again, the violence came and then came death. The shedding of innocent blood. All these kind of link together and I think really start with the pride. Really start with the pride. But we are called to be transformed by God. We are called to be transformed. He says, be ye not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind or the reconstructing of your mind. Church, if we just go through this life uh, um, passively, amen, and not proactively, our thoughts will lead us astray. Amen. Why? Because we're in this flesh. Even Now, don't get me wrong. I don't want to take away from what Christ has done in the work or in the life of a child of His, amen, in the life of a Christian. Because He says when He comes in, He puts a new heart in us. Amen. He puts a new heart in us. Now, now I don't have the same desires that I used to have, and I don't love the same things that I used to love, but I am still clothed in this flesh. Amen. I am still clothed in this flesh, amen. And I'm glad that He's taken out this heart of stone and He's put in a heart of flesh there, a heart to love the things that He loves and to hate the things that He hates. Amen. Thank God for that. Amen. But there is a battle of this flesh Amen. that if we don't renew our minds or reconstruct our minds, Amen. we're missing out on a transformation that He's trying to work in us. Amen? Amen. Renew your minds. Philippians 4 and 8, you know, we, going back to a heart that devises wicked imaginations, well, let's flip that around. Philippians 4 and 8 encourages us to think on the good things. He says, Behold, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just. This is contrary, amen, amen to, to, to wicked imaginations. Amen. Whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue, if there be any praise, think on these things. Church, if we'll set our minds to things right, what follows in actions 
will be that which is good and not that which is mischief. We will put ourselves in our actions with God and not in opposition to God if we start with our minds too. And then a false witness that speaks lies and he that sows discord among brethren. You know, and I, as I read that, I'm like, well, he kind of already covered lying in that first verse, or that uh, verse 19, I think it was. Proud look and a lying tongue. So I, I thought, well, what's the, what's, what else is there more? A false witness that speaketh lies. We know, again, this, this goes in opposition against the nature of God's truth. He is truth. Amen. But I got to thinking more about this. As a Christian, we are all witnesses. We are called to be witnesses of who He is. Of who He is and what He has done. Amen. We've been reading with the youth group or, or with our Sunday school cl class. After the resurrection, Christ was with His disciples for up to 40 days. Amen. And when He was ascended there in the book of Acts, chapter 1, it said that He, he told them, He said, Go and be witnesses. Amen. Go and be witnesses. So if you are saved tonight, you are a witness. But Jesus also warned while he was here on this earth, there'll be false teachers, preachers, essentially false witnesses. When we read in Matthew chapter 7, he says, many will come on that day saying, Lord, Lord. He said, depart from me, I never knew you. They're false witnesses. A false witness, somebody who that, that will claim to know Christ and to say he abides in here and lives in here, but his actions so declare something entirely different. For if you can look back on these first six that we've covered, a, a proud look, a lying tongue, feet, a heart that devises wicked imaginations, and feet that be swift and running to evil and to do mischief, amen. And if all that can abide in your life and you feel nothing over it, and you say Christ abides in you, I say you are a false witness. Now I'm not saying you'll not stray from the path. I'm not saying a lie might not come out of your mouth or an evil imagination not, might not run through your mind. But if you can do that and the Holy Spirit not convict your heart. You say, Brother Will, is that your opinion? No, that's not my opinion. John chapter, this is 1 John chapter 2 verse 4. He says, He that saith I know him and keepeth not his commandment is a liar, and the truth is not in him. He's a liar. Church, there's a lot of false witnesses out there today. There's a lot of false witnesses. And though we may stumble, though we may fall, if we don't hate the things that God hates, and we love the things that God hates, you can't claim that you know Christ. If you do, he says, you're a liar. And that's the truth. That's the truth. And, he, and ultimately what this will lead to is sowing discord among brethren, sowing strife among brethren, and division among brethren. How many times do you hear of... of, of I speak all this of... of a simple follower of Christ, any of us who, who take up the cross and say, I, I believe in Christ, I love Christ, I'm trusting in Christ. But what about the one who steps up to proclaim the gospel as a, as a preacher or a Sunday school teacher or an evangelist on TV? And they end up being a false witness because they, they so live a life that does not proclaim the gospel of Christ. How much more division does that cause? How much more discord and strife does that cause within the church? God hates this because it's in opposition to who He is. Again, it's in opposition to His truth. But also, we serve a God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. 
But 1 John 5 and 7 says, For there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, which is the Son, Jesus, and the Holy Ghost. And these three are one. The nature of God is unity. And when these things take place, there's division and strife and discord. And that's in opposition to who God is. Church, I think it's, under, it's important that we understand the nature of sin. That we understand the nature of, of what it means for things to be an abomination. I think it's a word that's uh, used kind of readily when talking about certain particular sins. But when it comes down to it, there are many things that are an abomination unto Him. That are disgusting in His sight. And they are so because they are in direct opposition to who he is. But I thank God because I was there. My life was an abomination to God. Your life was an abomination to God. It was a disgust. You lived in such a way that he hated in some way, shape, fashion, or form. But that all changed when you humbled yourself and you came to Him meek and lowly, calling out for forgiveness, putting your faith in something other than yourself. I'm glad that I can go from being the enemy of God, being a board of God, to coming into unity with Him. That no matter how disgusting I was to Him, no matter how filthy of rags my sin was in His sight, He said, I'll take them filthy rags, I'll take that sin-soaked heart, and I'll make it white as snow. You see, there's nobody too far gone for Him. Amen. But let us understand the nature of sin, why it is sinful, why God takes it so seriously. Amen.